They always were after us for something. It's always been water. It's just they want the water, they want the water. And if you don't have the means to fight them, you lost the ranch. Burns is a quiet town. But on a bitterly cold day, people are gathering to protest. Militia groups from out of state came to show support for two Oregon ranchers who must go back to prison for starting fires that burned on federal land, even though they already served time for the charges. It was actually making the national news in a big way. Cases caused a stir as both were charged under the anti-terrorism law, sparking debate over the federal government's authority. Why did they charge him with an anti-terrorism statute? The only reason I could think of was to put him in jail as long as they possibly could. But then everything went crazy. All right, let's take you to Oregon now, where armed protesters have taken over the headquarters of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Call me an occupier, call me a terrorist, call me a dadgum ignorant redneck. I don't care. I am here for Dwight Hammond, and they had better get out of that prison. You know, they say that there was an armed standoff in Harney County. That is a total, total bullshit lie. Hammonds are ranchers in a remarkable place in Southern Oregon. The Hammonds are the kind of people that you want to live next door. Really, really nice down home folks. Dwight is a very soft spoken man, very kind, helpful. He'll do anything if you ask him to, to help you out. Steve is active, quiet and soft-spoken like his father, very family-oriented, a very nice human, and a very hard-working human. They're very compassionate people. You can find other ranchers in the community that say, hey, you know, I needed to ship my cattle out and I didn't have any way of shipping them, and the Hammond showed up with their trucks and hauled my cattle for me. While I was building my log home up on the property that I purchased, they actually came one afternoon with a picnic lunch. And this is 45, 50 miles away. Those are the kind of people the Hammonds are. Dwight Hammond is my husband and we've been married for 55 years. We grew up together. <laughs> In 1964, we first moved here from Northern California. The tending of the population was to come north, and we were raising cattle, and the highways were becoming more congested, and highways and cows don't really mix. And we finally found this place that we liked. Dwight had the problem of telling his father that we weren't going to live in Northern California for our whole lifetime. One day, he said he was going to go and tell Dad today that... We were moving. He was gone for two or three hours and he came back. And I said, how'd it go? You'd never guess. He wants to go with us. <laughs> so we all moved up here. It's a very big ranch. It's on a place called Steens Mountain. Well, it doesn't look like any mountain in the world except itself. And it's in Harney County. The 
So Harney County is 10,000 square miles. It's about two thirds high desert. Most of it is above 4,000 feet in elevation. And we have several hundred thousand acres of state lands here. And the county is bigger than nine states in this nation. Harney County in general is a community made up of small town folks who work hard for a living, ranching families that go back for generations. You can see why the Hammonds wanted to ranch there. They, like most ranchers, have a grazing permit, which means they have private base commensurable property. That's their own, and it has been. And they own the water on that. What's known as the Dust Bowl, which is the Hammonds property, there's a drainage that comes off of the mountain that actually has quite a bit of water. Our ranch is special in that the water comes up on our ranch. The laws are in the state of Oregon, if it comes up on your ranch, you can use it until it goes off. You use the water or you lose it. Adjacent to the Hammond property on three sides is the National Wildlife Refuge. Now your National Wildlife Refuge is 190,000 acres in the middle of Harney County. It used to be all private land ranches. And through the Antiquities Act, President Roosevelt determined that there would be a bird refuge there. The Fish and Wildlife Service decided that they were going to manage it so that all of the resources went to the wildlife, including water rights that they didn't own. Even though that the National Wildlife Refuge has water, the Hammond property has a good deal of water. The Hammond property would augment the National Wildlife Refuge land greatly. The refuge system made a decision to survey their property lines and move their fences, created all kinds of issues for access for the Hammonds, access to their home. The Fish and Wildlife Service built a fence or tried to build a fence around the Hammonds water. And somebody got an old antique road grader and put it in the way of the construction equipment. Dwight had parked a piece of machinery down there because we had a bunch of cattle in there. There was 1,100 acres in that field. If they came in and built the fence and we didn't know it, the cattle would die from lack of water. In 1994, there was an altercation that occurred where federal agents had come onto Hammond's property and handcuffed Dwight and drug him off to prison. And so the feds had to come take him up to Portland and put him in jail in a federal holding cell. And they stayed there for longer than they should. We took it to court. It was a big, long trial, and we ended up winning. And then they did nothing to remove the fence or to make it accessible to us. And we knew that if we removed the fence or if we did anything, we would be charged with destruction of federal property or whatever. So I went back to the judge and asked him, what's the next step? He just shook his head and was bewildered himself. He said he couldn't do anything. He couldn't even subpoena a federal agency to come into his courtroom. They wouldn't show up. A little bit later, we got into water problems again, same kind of a scenario. We, you just had to be so careful because they were just waiting to throw somebody in jail for some reason. It's just they want the water, they want the water, and if you don't have the means to fight them, you lost the ranch. It was kind of like cancer. They called us to Salem and threw a 19 count indictment over 18 years, I believe, for setting every fire that they didn't have already tagged to somebody else. 
anything that had happened on that place was put into a case that was charged against Dwight or Stephen. It was huge number of fires that they were accused of committing. Absolutely absurd. The first arson that they accused them of occurred in 2001, and it took them 10 years to file any charges. I mean, my goodness, 10 years. What Dwight and Steve did isn't in the same category as arson. What Dwight and Steve did was start a fire to try and make their land better. That's what a prescribed burn does. It's a common practice within the ranching industries. They lit the fire in early afternoon after the temperatures had warmed up on their property. And then at night, the winds turn around and blow from the top of the mountain down to the bottom of the valley again. So that takes a fire and pushes it back on itself. And the temperatures cool off and the fires lay down and go out. But what happens to the grass is when it comes back, it comes back healthier. The brush is gone. And it's actually better for elk and cows in the future. One section of the fire trail ran up a draw and burned 138 acres of BLM allotment land. 138 acres is, is huge if you consider it in a highly dense populated city. But out here, there's hundreds of thousands of acres where you have uninterrupted views, really nothing, just wide open spaces. So 138 acres is just this ridge top here and a little bit of that finger over there. Normally what occurs is they get is what's called a fire trespass from the BLM because what happens is it takes that grass out of grazing season for a couple of years. And so the BLM loses like $400. It is not against the law anywhere in the United States to manage a prescribed burn. Then the next fires were a series of fires that occurred in 2006. The 2006 fires, when those occurred, it was a lightning storm beyond lightning storm. There were like 1,700 lightning strikes. The whole goddamn mountain was on fire. Steve calls the BLM to find out if there was a fire burning up on Moon Hill. Sure enough, there is a fire. Well, that's where all their winter feed is. So what Steve did was start a back burn. You have a fire that's moving towards you and what you try to do is if you can get in front of the fire enough you burn a section you burn some land to remove the fuel he lit the back burn burned his own property and then it burned one acre one acre of blm land and the fire didn't go any further what they charged them with was the uh, 1996 anti-terrorism and death penalty law of arson. So say I was Timothy McVeigh and I blew up the Oklahoma federal building and it started a fire that then went along. They could charge me under the statute with blowing things up, killing people and arson. That is the arson they were charged with. Our family members are not terrorists. I don't know how you could put a charge like terrorism when you look at the things that are going on in the world and compare that to ranch life in Eastern Oregon. Why did they charge him with an anti-terrorism statute? The only reason I could think of was to put him in jail as long as they possibly could. Including opening and closing statements, the trial took eight days. The two fires that they were found guilty of were the two fires that they had admitted to starting. The 2001 prescribed burn that got away from them onto their allotment land for 138 acres. And then the 2006 fire that Steve had lit to protect their winter feed. The jury was tasked of finding innocence or guilt, whether they were... Uh, part of a conspiracy, whether they had uh, had maliciously started all of those fires that the BLM had accused them of, of starting. 
but they were not aware that the charges brought against them were from uh, the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty Act that carried a mandatory minimum of five years. What's a mandatory minimum sentence? If, for example, you are convicted of kidnapping in the first degree, you're going to go to prison for 90 months. And because it's a mandatory minimum, you're going to do every minute of those 90 months. You're not going to get paroled out early. You get a 90 month sentence, you're going to do 90 months. No, I don't think the jury would have convicted Dwight and Steve if they would have understood that the penalty was a five-year mandatory minimum. Well, Dwight's 74 years old, and to have Dwight be convicted of an anti-terrorism charge for five years is potentially a death sentence for him. The lawyers talked to the judge, and the Hammonds agreed to accept the jury's verdict as they had been stated thus far, and they would accept whatever the judge sentenced them to. And the prosecution then spouted up and said that he agreed with that, but they would have to give up their appellate rights as well as their 2255 rights, that they gave up all rights of appealing. There is nobody that can sanely say that this was terrorism. The presiding judge, Michael Hogan, even said that it would be a terrible injustice. In fact, the words he used were it would shock the conscience, quote unquote, to require that the father and son ranchers go to prison for five years for what they did. He gave them what he thought was a just sentence, which was uh, three months for Dwight in a year for Stephen. I hate to think that your government could take away your ranch. But it's obvious, if you look back at it and don't have a biased opinion, that they wanted our ranch. Fire, if that's what it took, they'd take whatever was handed to them. When there were new states coming in, there was what was called public land. Now, it meant something in those days. It doesn't anymore. But what it meant then was it was for sale to the public. Come to Ohio and buy this section of land and pay us not much, and it's yours. We need the population. We need to settle this new state. They made it easy. But there was a trick. Every new state had to sign a compact in what's called an enabling act that would enable you to vote and become a state with the federal government that all of the citizens of this new state now and forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated lands of this new state. That meant that the states didn't own the land except for the part that had already been bought. If it was private property already, the federal government didn't bother about that. They did bother about the stuff that was left. The meaning of public land had changed. It just meant not something you could buy as time went on. It meant something that the federal government owned. What is the government going to do with this land that's supposed to be public? The Southwest might seem a lonely place, big and barren of not much use, an empty wasteland, but it does grow grass, and from that grass flows one of America's greatest production lines, the cattle of the beef industry. They began to see that some of this land was not going to be used by settlers. It was too arid, it was uh, not fertile, and so the Taylor Grazing Act allowed for ranchers to go on public lands, raise their cattle or sheep, and pay the federal government some minimum amount. This is the land, the public land. It belongs to you and me. 
more than 300 million acres of land, more than an acre for each American. The bulk of the land is in the western states, including Alaska. Far from many Americans, yet this land is important to us all, no matter where we live. It's managed by the Interior Department's Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau of Land Management was formed in 1946, designed to really meet the needs of ranchers and mining companies. That all changed in 1976. Controversy over the use of the resources of the public lands has intensified in recent years. The Bureau must resolve conflicting interests within the multiple use and sustained yield principles of the 1976 Federal Land Policy and Management Act. The Act directs the Bureau to administer the public lands for the benefit of all Americans. With FLIPMA, the federal government said, from now on, the public domain lands that are managed by the Bureau of Land Management will be managed in a multiple use philosophy. We will provide for recreation and environmental issues and we'll meet the Endangered Species Act. No longer was the BLM merely there to do what ranchers and mining companies wanted them to do. That's when the unhappiness began with the miners and the ranchers. Story that has captured national headlines and is continuing to stir controversy in a rural part of southern Nevada. The root of the issue is a 20-year-long battle between a farmer and the federal government. Rancher Cliven Bundy has refused to pay grazing rights for his cattle that roam the public land surrounding his 160-acre farm. But the BLM considers the animals as trespass cattle. And since Bundy will not pay $1 million in grazing fees occurred over the years, officials have now hired cowboys and helicopters to round those cattle up. In the Bunker Hill situation, to my understanding, the Bundy family had been ranching in that part of Nevada before BLM became an agency. And when BLM was formed, the deal was they would improve grazing lands and improve water for cattle. As time moved on, the deal changed. And it was no longer about improving grazing and water rights. It was about the restriction and access to those lands, which those ranchers generationally had relied on. My rights are all older than BLM even existed, but my rights were created through beneficial use. And so they're, they're, beneficial use means we use the forage and the water from the, time, the very first pioneers come here. Bundy had an argument that he had a grandfathered right to graze on that land because he was doing it for the last 140 years. Grazing allotment requires a permit and there is a fee attached to that permit. Mr. Bundy decided he was not going to pay those grazing permits. He thought he had no duty to pay for a grazing permit because he had everything that the permit required. He had private commensurable property, which is what the law of the permit says. You have to have that. Well, he did. And he had to have water. And if memory serves, he had adjudicated water rights where he had the water. And so he figured, why should I pay the feds for that right? Now, the feds will tell you what the answer is, and that is because we say so. When you don't pay your grazing permit, it's just like if you rent an apartment and you don't pay your rent, you get evicted. Federal rangers stood with tasers ready and dogs poised to go on the attack. What'd they do, Evan? They tased me twice. Tased you? These protesters came within inches of law enforcement trying to get the BLM to leave this section of public land. We're sick of you being here. The Bundy family says they're willing to put themselves in danger, not just for cattle, but essentially their livelihood. They claim federal rangers are killing their cattle in the process of rounding them up. In 2014, they came down upon my family and put us under siege and threatened that they were going to kill us, that, that this would be another Waco or Ruby Ridge, in their own words, if we resisted in any way. Back up. 
They were killing the cattle from the helicopter and from the ground. They were separating the baby calves from their mothers, leaving the baby calves, brand new baby calves out in the desert to die. They ended up calling a virtual who's who people's army into southern Nevada, armed patriot groups, militia members who said that they would act out violently if the federal government went to enforce court orders. It's time the states take back our public lands. The BLM doesn't know how to manage Jack. We rallied and went up and gave them a choice to either kill us or to leave. Song. No, that's no, it. it's the people. Or not. You, you guys need to leave. Okay. You need to leave. That's, that's the time. The situation. No, they stood in a line facing a line as big as theirs of federal agents and somebody said stand down and that was the smartest thing i ever saw the federal government do when you have an event in a particular location at a particular time where you have teams of people coming from across the country who are armed to challenge the enforcement of an order. Sometimes a tactical retreat is the best way to avoid a loss of life. And I think the federal government and the Bureau of Land Management made the correct decision at that time in retreating. The problem was people in the anti-government, the wise use movement took that as a victory. And what it did was cause the rhetoric to rise to a level where they were looking for other bunkervilles to take place in different parts of the West. We're going to kick the BLM out of the state, kick all the other federal agencies out of the state that aren't authorized to be here, and uh, get this right. I'm confident that our state will get it right, and I'm confident that all the other states will get it right as well. It brought attention to the plight of ranchers, of miners, of timber workers. They had the ability to stand up to this oppressive force that BLM has been exerting throughout the country. So when the judge sentenced him, he said it would be cruel and unusual if I demanded that they spend the five-year minimum in prison for 140 acres. He said that. So he sentenced Dwight to three months and Stephen to one year and one day. Dwight and Stephen did their time. They came home. After they came home, the U.S. federal government decided to pursue the mandatory minimum. The sentencing judge at that time deviated from what the law allowed as far as sentencing guidelines went. The prosecution filed an appeal on the decision, and that appeal went to the Ninth Circuit Court. The Ninth Circuit Court said the original sitting judge did not have the authority to not give the mandatory minimum. Judges absolutely have no authority when it comes to sentencing. They just, it says mandatory minimum, so that's what you got to give. We thought, no, this can't, no way, this, we've been through all this stuff. And everybody said mandatory minimum under this charge is five years. That's where the Hammonds, I think, really didn't understand the implications that that if they gave up their right to appeal, they thought that that the prosecution wouldn't have any rights to appeal either. And that wasn't the case. The Hammonds were resentenced and they reported to prison on January 4th. Double jeopardy is a circumstance where you cannot be tried twice for the same charge. The Hammonds were not tried twice. What happened was the Court of Appeals sent the case back to the trial court and said, you will do it right. You will sentence them according to the law. The judge made a legal error uh, and the Court of Appeals corrected it and that's why the Hammonds are back in prison now. It's not double jeopardy. Why should they pay for the judiciary system making a mistake? I think if you serve your time, you served your time. 
we are supposed to have a fair and balanced justice system. You know, sending a 74-year-old rancher back to prison after he served his sentence in entirety is not an American value. It's unjust. I think the judge that made that decision should be sanctioned. I still think that today. He violated the very rules that he was obligated to defend. The rule was pretty plain, and I don't know what a mandatory minimum is, but we've had a bunch of attorneys sitting there for I don't know how many days, and all of them know what it is. And I can't believe that this is what's going to come down at us, that they've already served their time. That part of your life was over with. Well, that's not the case if the government's after you. The doorbell rang early in the morning and I don't get up really early, so I'm thinking bad thoughts of him already. <laughs> I answered the door and he said that he was Ammon Bundy and he asked me if I was Mrs. Hammond and I said, yeah, and he said, I'd like to talk to you. One Monday night, a message came on my phone, an article, another article about the Hammonds. And immediately, this overwhelming urge came upon me to find out about the Hammonds. I had read about them in the newspaper. We sure could see a lot of similarities between the way that they were being treated down there, not knowing them or anything about their situation and the way we were being treated up here. And he handed me a letter. And then that next morning, I felt this urge again, this desire to begin to write. I got on my knees and I asked the Lord and said, Lord, if you want me to write something, then please help me clear my mind and show me what I should write. The Lord was not pleased with what was happening to the Hammonds. What was happening to them, if it was not corrected, would be a type and a shadow of what would happen to the rest of the people across this country. And then once I got the letter written, I felt this desire, this urge to go to Burns and go to the Hammonds Ranch. It was a good letter. It was a very nice, kind letter. When I got through reading it, I looked at him and I said, and who wrote the letter? Because I'd never had a man around my house that could write a letter like that. <laughs> and he said, uh, I did. And then I hesitated for a minute. And he says, well, I have to tell you the truth. He said, my wife got up before I left. And <laughs> she changed the spelling for me and she printed it to where you could read it. Susie gave me a call and said, these folks were in town. Their names were uh, Eamon Bundy. And did I remember them? Oh, yeah, the fella that had the cows on the range that the BLM was trying to get off his allotment land. And she said, yeah, those are the folks. And they've come into town to, to show us our support. We were in a very similar situation. People came to our defense. And because the people came, we now are free. And she began to get hope. And then she shared them with Dwight. And he began to get a little hope that possibly, possibly the American people might be able to do something about these gross violations of their God-given rights. Before he left, he brought in a box of apples. And I said, what time did you leave home? And he said, 3.30 or something. And I said, and you picked apples before you left home to bring to my house? He said, well, I had to bring something. And he said, and I have to tell you, I didn't pick them off the tree. He said, they fell off the tree. And I just picked them off the ground and put them in a box. But they're good apples. <laughs> He's just a kind, um, generous man. Um, <laughs> it's like from then, it just escalated. One of our founders, B.J. Soper, lives up in Bend. B.J. became aware of the Hammond situation because it's just a couple hours from where he lives. He drew that attention to leadership of PPN, the founders.
we all traveled to Burns and sat down with the Hammond family, interviewed them, and then we went over and we sat down with Sheriff Ward. That was when I first met Ammon Bundy. Ammon and I did not see eye to eye on some of the methodology and tactics and things that he was discussing. He was a little more aggressive in his stance. What the Bundys had wanted the Hammonds to do was to not turn themselves in. They wanted the Hammonds, they wanted the sheriff actually to protect the Hammonds and not let the federal marshals take them. They flat out told me, either you tell the federal government these people are not going back to prison or we're going to bring thousands of people to town and do that for you. The Harney County Sheriff is certainly not going to go and interfere with another jurisdiction's uh, result in a criminal case. He has no basis to do that. He has no right to do that. You've got a lawful and binding sentence. We can't pick and choose who should serve their jail sentences and who shouldn't. So the Hammond said, absolutely not. We are going to turn ourselves in. We are going to follow the law and we, we can't have anything to do with that. The sheriff ignores us for weeks and basically he will not stand. So then we go to the commissioners. We say, hey, look, we need you to put an evidential hearing board together so that you can expose these corruptions that are going on and make sure that this doesn't happen so it doesn't set a precedence. They went to the county commissioners and I was um, openly smiling and kind of picking on my two county commissioners. Hey, guys, uh, I'm sure glad he's coming to see you and not me. Eventually, he came into this office and gave me about a 10 minute tirade on the Constitution. And I said, Mr. Bundy, thank you for your your perspective. And I'd like to tell you what my perspective is and you know, on the Constitution and the one I think is correct. And he said, I'm not interested and walked out of here. At that point, PPN was fact finding. We wanted to make sure what was happening in the Hammonds was factual and accurate. We want to have the opportunity to get the sheriff and local law enforcement perspective on it. We all left there with, okay, we'll probably have a support rally. And we scheduled, PPN scheduled a support rally for the Hammonds uh, in December. Hey guys, what's up? Blaine Cooper. I'm in Burns, Oregon. And we're here to support the Hammonds. Now, Joe's going to give you a little information about what's going on out here, Joe. Basically, where we're standing right now, this is a call out, an alert to all patriots, constitutionalists, militias, and good Americans who believe in the Constitution. We are doing a patriot convoy in uh, Burns, Oregon. Militia groups from out of state came to show support for two Oregon ranchers who must go back to prison for starting fires that burned on federal land, even though they already served time for the charges. I believe there was roughly around 400 people. They call themselves patriot groups. Idaho 3% was involved, the Con Central Oregon Constitutional Guard. There's an umbrella group called the Pacific Patriots. I was concerned that these people were going to come in here and they were going to ransack downtown and tear things up. The rally was put on very professionally. We were told right off the bat there will be no radical behavior, you know. They were going to throw pennies out on the sidewalk at the sheriff's office. Some protesters also blame the Harney County Sheriff for not protecting the residents of the county from the federal government. They threw pennies onto the sidewalk in front of Sheriff David Ward's office. Threw I don't know how many dollars worth of pennies at my uh, windows and doors out here. And uh, I read somewhere on the internet that was to signify the sheriff selling out his citizens. Nothing that went on with the Hammonds as it relates to the arson case that they got resentenced on had anything to do with the Harney County Circuit Court or the sheriff. You got to be a special kind of dedicated to come and demonstrate in front of an empty building because it was a Saturday. They were going to come and do this thing that had no connection with the underlying problem in January when it's, you know, eight degrees outside. More than 100 carrying signs and flags. Go ahead, yeah. Marching in a convoy to the rancher's home. <laughs> to show their support. The most humbling experience. <laughs> 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 
I'd been trying to get it in the news media for months. I'd been writing Fox. I'd been writing ABC, NBC, you name it. I tried to get online and send them notes and letters and stuff. And can you please, you know, report on this? Can you please report on this? And then all of a sudden the Bundy show up and, oh, baby. Dwight says it feels like a life sentence at his age. This makes it over for me. I'm not, uh, not very happy about that. But then everything went crazy. We got back to Safeway and Ammon got up and he said, well, the fairgrounds is rented for anybody that wants to go out there, but we're going to go make a hard stand. Anybody that wants to go with us can. Anybody that doesn't want to, that's fine too. What in the hell is going on? But those that understand that they came to make a hard stand, those that know what's going on here and have seen it for many, 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 many years, those who are ready to actually do something about it, I'm asking you to follow me and go to the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And we're going to make a hard stand. Now, there are already agents on the roads that are blocked the road. And they do not want us to go out there. And we're going to go out there anyway. People started approaching me going, hey, Emma's going out the refuge. I'm like, what are you talking about? Why? He says he's going to take it over. We received a 911 call from somebody who had been in the vehicles with them and said, hey, a bunch of guys just jumped out, you know, took over the, the refuge. And they're going through military style, clearing these rooms. And he got scared and left and reported it. The county clerk called me and said, boy, did you hear Bundy just took over the refuge? And I thought he was kidding. And the community at that point, which was incredibly supportive, completely 180s and turns very upset and hostile. And so we're trying to give them guidance on how they can take steps to have their voice heard in the local government. And now we've got the refuge being occupied. Armed men took the refuge, went through clearing the buildings and had made statements along the lines of don't fire unless fired upon. There's nothing peaceful about that. We have taken over the refuge. We have made, it, made a hard stand. We need you to come. We need those of you who understand what is happening in this country to come and to stand. I was 33, I was single, I had three children of my own at the time, and I met him at a church dance. Everyone took a partner in a circle, and as the bell rang throughout the music, then you would change partners. I thought, oh my gosh, that cute cowboy is never going to get around to me. There's quite a few couples in this circle. Lo and behold, the dance ended with him as my last partner. That was our first meeting. After that, he asked me out and 14 days later, we were married. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Lloyd Fritikum. It's uh, September, 2014, I'm out here on my, my ranch. Uh, it's great out here, the, the rains have come this summer. And the grass is tall, it's still green. My cows are fat. Just feeling really grateful for all the blessings that I'm enjoying right now. But it doesn't take too much to see that dark storm clouds are gathering. We started listening to the news and heard of the Bundy situation. And that's when my husband first kind of started listening and trying to understand what it was that Cliven was not agreeing with. When he heard Cliven and heard his position of states' rights. My husband asked if he could ride, and Cliven said, be here first thing in the morning. I was pretty worried for him. 
and there were a lot of agents tacked out with the full gear. They returned the cows and they left. Hello everyone, this is Lavoy Fernicum. I think I'm pretty upset this evening. I've been going since five this morning and headed out and take a load of cows out to my, my winter range. I'll be back sometime tonight in the dark. But I've been following what's happening over in Bend, Oregon with that ranching family over there, the Hammond family. And I'm pretty upset with what uh, Dubelham has done to them. Actually, I'm really angry. They threw him in jail. They fined him a tremendous amount of fines. And now it looks like they're facing five more years in prison. Uh, these are real lives. These are real people. And by dang, I'm angry about it. A call came in and asked if he wanted to go up to Burns to attend the rally. He uh, packed a backpack with an overnight set of clothes and he left that evening. During the end part of the rally, Ammon approached them with the idea of going to Malheur. Good boy, I'm doing this for my kids. I have 20 grandkids, daughters and sons. I want them to be free. We'll uphold the Constitution. We'll return these resources to the people. It belongs to the people of Harney County, these, these, these good folks. And so I'll stand here uh, with my friends. All right, let's take you to Oregon now, where armed protesters have taken over the headquarters of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. They're calling on other so-called American patriots to join them and stand up against the government in Washington. It just didn't make sense to me. I had only met Ammon one time. I didn't know what he was trying to prove or could prove or why he went out there in the middle of the winter. The militia say they're not ruling out resorting to violence either if police try to remove them from the federal premises. I was mad. I was upset because I had heard that it was a hostile takeover of the refuge and they broke into things and we heard all these horror stories of what was going on. It went from a good thing <laughs> to a, oh no, because now they were being kind of lawless and they were packing guns. And I am 100% willing to lay my life down to fight against tyranny in this country. Then I had a friend who went by the refuge and said, I don't know what everybody's talking about. There's like eight, maybe 10 dudes freezing their butts off around a campfire. buildings were all unlocked. The keys were there for them. There was no one there. Just said to open to the public, you know, and that was it. We kind of started realizing what was really going on, that it wasn't this big military type operation, that it was more of a sit-in, um, an occupation We plan on hurting no one. We're only restoring freedom, liberties, so that these good people can use their lands and resources again. And that is why we're here. When we first heard the reports about armed men taking over the refuge, I think you, you had a certain image in your mind. When, when I got there, it was kind of offsetting. There becomes a time when people are ignored to the point where they're frustrated. They don't know what else to do. They, they see an injustice, but all levels of government are ignoring that. And the uh, prudent methods are not allowed to the people. And that is when the people have a right to take a hard stand. They were having 
press conferences and they were all out. Most of the people that were armed were either holstered or just not showing it. I, you know, it seemed that they were doing a very coordinated effort to not show their weapons, at least not in the public or at least not in the front where they were having their press conferences. I mean, we've stood in protest, we've waved signs, we've marched around buildings, we've done every single thing we possibly could, and it was time to do something in offense rather than just defense. We were sitting here looking at each other going, well, what do we do now? I mean, we cannot let this set as a precedent. It wasn't like we raided down in here, we walked down in here. I didn't even have a weapon on me. This happened like that. It happened quick. The public was not aware that we've been in town here meeting with these people, uh, learning about the history, learning about the tyranny and the oppression that they're living under. This was a last chance, last stand situation. It's not like we just came out here and did this. You have what are basically conservative, Christian, patriotic, flag-waving, hardworking American ranchers. Okay, these guys are not terrorists. Okay, They have a grievance. They feel pushed to such desperation that they take a desperate action like this to engage in an armed occupation. It's difficult for a fair-minded person to immediately determine who is right and who is wrong. We've got to return the rights of the people. We cannot allow this to happen again. We encourage everybody to stand up for the Constitution peacefully. Peacefully, we encourage every, you know, particularly we reach out to the county commissioners. We reach out to the state legislatures. Okay, these lands belong to the state and her people. These rights belong to the people. Please uphold your oath of office and protect them. What are these guys doing? What are they thinking? There's a time and place for everything. And I fully understand Ammon's message. I fully understand the frustration. I don't think the execution at that time and place was the appropriate time. Uh, PPN and leadership came out and we denounced it, but we understood why he was saying it. The media portrayal was essentially one of armed militia going crazy and taking over this federal facility. We, we didn't want conflict. We don't want, nobody wants to have any bloodshed. You know, they, again, that's the media trying to stir it up with militants and all these big scary words, these words that have become scary to the public. Uh, militia. It's very important that each of you know this is intended to be a peaceful occupation, if so be, if you want to use those words. This is intended to be peaceful. We want all people to be safe. We want all law enforcement lives to be safe. We want our lives to be safe. The only reason that we have guns here is for our own personal protection and safety. Right now, the 